In the 1960s, Britain and France set out to create the most advanced passenger jet in history. A sleek, supersonic aircraft that would shrink the world and symbolize technological supremacy. The Concorde wasn't just an aircraft, it was a pinnacle of aviation technology and passenger luxury. But did you know that the Soviet Union built its own version? Unfortunately for the Soviets, while the Concorde became a luxury icon for the wealthy elite, their version would take a different path. One marked by rushed development, a tragic airshow disaster, and an untimely demise after just 55 passenger flights. In the 1960s, the world was locked in a technological race, not just to the moon, but also in the skies. The West, particularly Britain and France, had a bold vision. A supersonic passenger jet, the Concorde, that would redefine air travel. But the Soviet Union, eager to prove its technological might, couldn't afford to be left behind. The USSR had to respond. The Soviet Union was vast, with remote cities scattered across Siberia, making supersonic travel not just a luxury, but a practical necessity for government officials and high-ranking personnel. While the West debated the environmental impact and disruptive noise of supersonic transport, the USSR had a different perspective. Its enormous, sparsely populated landmass provided ample airspace where sonic booms could go unnoticed. Even if international landing rights were restricted, the Soviet Concorde could still serve as a high-speed workhorse for domestic and regional routes, slashing week-long rail journeys into mere hours and reinforcing Soviet dominance over its own immense territory. But developing a supersonic airliner is incredibly difficult, more than just making a plane fast. It requires new materials, advanced aerodynamics, and engines that don't guzzle fuel at an unsustainable rate. The West had years of collaboration and careful planning, while the Soviets, under intense political pressure, had to rush their own design. So they turned to Tupolev, their legendary aircraft manufacturer, and essentially said, make one, now. And so the Tupolev Design Bureau worked at breakneck speed, allegedly using industrial espionage to obtain blueprints from Concorde's development. In just five years, they produced the TU-144, the world's first supersonic passenger jet, which even beat Concorde to the skies with its maiden flight in 1968. On the surface, it seemed like a triumph. The TU-144 was a cutting-edge marvel of speed, built to outrun sound itself, but stopping it was another matter entirely. Unlike Western airliners, it lacked reverse thrust capabilities, leaving engineers with an old-school solution, a braking parachute, one of the last ever used on a commercial aircraft. Every landing became a dramatic spectacle, with a massive chute deploying to bring the supersonic jet to a halt, just one of many extreme design choices, including the fitting of ejection seats in early prototypes, as if the pilots were strapping into a fighter jet rather than an airliner. When the Soviets unveiled the TU-144 at the 1973 Paris Air Show, they were ready to prove they had won. But then, disaster struck. The plane's pilot, possibly under orders to push the aircraft beyond safe limits, attempted a risky maneuver, but lost control, sending the supersonic jet into a catastrophic dive. But this wasn't just any crash. It happened in front of thousands of spectators, with the aircraft breaking apart mid-air and plummeting into a French village, killing all six crew members and eight people on the ground. Instead of proving Soviet dominance, the disaster shattered the Soviet Concorde's credibility, turning it into a symbol of rushed engineering and reckless ambition. The TU-144 was meant to be the pride of Soviet aviation, a supersonic marvel proving that the USSR could match the West in cutting-edge technology. But in just 102 flights, it suffered a staggering 226 failures, with half occurring mid-air, critical issues with flight instruments, navigation systems, radios, and autopilot, making every journey a gamble. The aircraft's reliability was so poor that even after its grand inaugural passenger flight, follow-up flights were suddenly cancelled, with Aeroflot blaming bad weather, only for journalists to discover that the skies at the destination were perfectly clear. 
The Soviet Concorde promised passengers the thrill of supersonic speed, racing across the skies faster than any other commercial jet. But unlike Concorde, which could cruise efficiently at Mach 2, the Tu-144 needed its afterburners at all times, flooding the cabin with an unrelenting roar. The noise levels inside the aircraft averaged 90 to 95 decibels, making normal conversation nearly impossible and turning the luxury of high-speed travel into a deafening ordeal. Passengers sitting side by side had to shout to be heard, while those two seats apart had no choice but to pass handwritten notes like schoolchildren. And at the rear of the cabin, the noise was described as simply unbearable, making the TU-144 less of a futuristic luxury and more of an ear-splitting endurance test at 60,000 feet. But the problems didn't stop there. Over the following months, the Soviet Concorde faced pressurization failures, landing gear malfunctions, and engine overheating, forcing aborted flights and emergency returns. And when cracks from metal fatigue were discovered in the vertical stabilizer, the solution was to simply bolt on a titanium doubler plate, a desperate attempt to keep an aircraft flying that was already spiraling toward failure. In January of 1978, Pilot Alexander Larin found himself at the controls of what should have been a routine Tu-144 passenger flight. However, before takeoff, up to eight onboard systems had already failed, with a high-profile international audience on board, including foreign journalists and dignitaries, cancelling the flight would have been a political embarrassment. So the decision was made to press on. As the aircraft roared into the sky, failures continued to cascade at an alarming rate eventually reaching as many as 24 system malfunctions mid-flight. If you thought that was bad, the worst was yet to come. As the aircraft cruised at supersonic speeds, Tupolev's crisis center predicted a catastrophic landing. Only the right side landing gear might deploy, forcing the jet to touch down over 300 kilometers an hour on a single set of wheels. The situation was so dire that Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev was personally informed of the unfolding crisis. And if that wasn't enough, a deafening alarm siren, similar to an air raid warning, blared throughout the cabin from takeoff to landing, refusing to shut off until the crew, in desperation, shoved a pillow inside the speaker. But in a final twist, after all the chaos and suspense, the landing gear miraculously extended, and the Tupolev landed safely, a rare moment of luck for an aircraft that seemed doomed from the start. The Tu-144 was meant to revolutionize air travel, proving that the Soviet Union could match the West with its own supersonic airliner. But after just 55 passenger flights, it became clear that the aircraft was riddled with problems, chronic system failures, unbearable cabin noise, and an appalling safety record that made every flight an exercise in risk management. In June 1978, after a mid-air mechanical failure forced an emergency landing, Aeroflot abruptly cancelled all passenger services, ending the Tu-144's short-lived dream of commercial success. However, grounding the aircraft entirely would have been an admission of failure, something the Soviet leadership was unwilling to accept. Rather than scrapping it, the Tu-144 was quietly reassigned to freight duty, carrying cargo instead of passengers. And while this kept the plane flying for a little while longer, it was a far cry from its original purpose. What was once meant to be a prestige symbol of Soviet innovation had been reduced to a noisy, unreliable and impractical freight hauler, limping through a few more years before being retired for good in 1983. 